Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here on this chilly morning. Um, thanks for those who came to the class this morning. Um, and if you have any other questions or ideas of things you'd like to have us talk about, just let me know. Uh, I wanted to uh, say that a little bird mentioned to me that Marlis has a birthday tomorrow. I will not reveal who the little bird was, but <laughs> happy birthday. Yes. So, um, today we are going to uh, be dedicating our quilts. As you can see, we have, uh, once again, a church full of beautiful quilts, as well as the school kits here for um, kids in other parts of the world who don't have school supplies to help them learn. So um, the women of the world word have been working very hard all year to accomplish this. It's a small group, but mighty. They get a lot done. So if you were a helper with the quilts project, would you please stand? Not everybody's here today, but it's a, a group of about six ladies who really get it done. And if you're a confirmation student who helped carry all the quilts up, will you please stand? Yes. Let's recognize this group. <laughs> all right. Also today, uh, we are going to recognize our veterans. Uh, we have just celebrated Veterans Day, so I would appreciate if anyone who has served our country in the military would please stand. Thank you for your service. <clears throat> Any other announcements this morning? Music Worship and Music uh, Committee is going to meet after church today to select music for the next couple of months. So anybody who wants to help with that in the basement, uh, please get together with Kurt. Okay. If not, what I would like us to do for the dedication, uh, I would like Rhett to come up here and help me by help me bless the school kits because he knows all about school, right? <laughs> These are going to go to kids in other places, and uh, so I'm going to have you put your hand somewhere on them, okay? Just rest your hand on them. We're going to bless them, okay? And I'd like everybody out there to put their hands on the quilts that are in front of them, and we are going to dedicate these. God, you have called us to go and do likewise as we reach out to our neighbors around the world. Send forth your spirit today as we call upon you to bless our work and make it holy. Jesus, teach us to love our neighbors. God, we give you thanks for those who have generously shared their resources in order to make these quilts possible. Move us by their example to live generous lives. Teach us to love our neighbors. Thank you, God, for the hands that have made and assembled these quilts and kits. May each compassionate touch be known to those who receive them as an expression of your love. Jesus, teach us to love our neighbors. God, we lift before you the staff and partners of Orphan Grain Train who will distribute these quilts around the world. Give them strength and encouragement to do this important work and guide them as they reach our neighbors who are the farthest away. Jesus, teach us to love our neighbors. Finally, God, we pray for our neighbors around the world who will receive these quilts and kits. Neighbors we have never met, neighbors who are far away, neighbors who, like us, long for your grace and mercy. May these quilts wrap our neighbors in love and fill them with the hope and peace that is found only in you. Amen. Thank you. Our opening hymn is Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling.
We begin our worship with a brief order of confession and forgiveness. We do this from the font because we remember each time we ask for forgiveness, we're remembering our baptism and how our sins were washed away then, and they're washed away again every time we ask Jesus to forgive us. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Our video story today is from the book of Exodus, and I, I want to just briefly point out, uh, you'll see that it's Exodus 3 through 13, so it's 10 chapters of the Bible condensed into a five-minute video, um, and it's the same with our readings today. We cannot possibly read all of it here today. So I really urge you to go home, take out your Bible, turn to Exodus, and read the first uh, 13 chapters, you'll get the whole story, and it's a really interesting story. So, God to the rescue. Zonda Kids presents the Jesus Storybook Bible. Every story whispers his name. Written by Sally Lloyd-Jones and read by David Suchet. To the rescue. Joseph and his brothers grew old and died, but their children's children stayed on in Egypt where they became a very large family. Later on, a new king began to rule, but this pharaoh didn't remember Joseph and he didn't like God's people. He made them into his slaves and beat them and made them work harder and harder. God's people cried out to God to rescue them. And God heard them. He remembered his promise to Abraham, 
He would look after his people. He would find a way to set them free. One day, Moses was looking after sheep when something caught his eye. A bush was behaving very oddly. It was flickering with flames, but its leaves weren't burning up. He took a closer look. Moses! boomed a big voice. Moses leapt back. Well, the bush was talking to him. I have heard my people's cries, God said. I have seen their tears. So I have come down to rescue them. Go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go free. Moses was afraid, but God said, I will be with you. So Moses went to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, Moses began. God says, God, said Pharaoh, never heard of him. Moses kept going. God says, let his people go free. Why should I, Pharaoh said, don't want to, won't. So he didn't. So God gave Pharaoh 10 warnings called plagues. First, God turned the river Nile into blood. No one could drink the water. But still Pharaoh would not let them go. So God made frogs come hopping and leaping and jumping in your bed frogs, in your hair frogs, in your soup frogs, all over everywhere frogs. Make them go away, Pharaoh screamed. Then your people can go. So God took the frogs away. But Pharaoh changed his mind. You can't go, he said. Then God sent zillions of gnats. But still Pharaoh said no. So then God sent swarms of flies. Flies buzzing in your eyes flies. And after that, sickness. And horrible boils. And huge hailstones. And a storm of locusts. Then darkness when it should have been day, until it seemed that the whole world, creation, everything was coming undone, falling back into darkness and emptiness and nothingness. But each time Pharaoh said, make it stop and then I'll let them go. And each time when God made it stop, Pharaoh changed his mind and said, actually, no, you can't go. Well, finally, Moses warned Pharaoh, obey God or he will have to send the worst thing of all. And Pharaoh just laughed. So God said, the oldest boy in each family of Egypt must die, but my people will be safe. God told his people to take their best lamb, to kill it, and to put some of its blood on their front doors. When God passes over your house, Moses explained, God will see the blood and know that the lamb died instead of you. That night, it was just as God had said. <coughs> Suddenly, piercing the darkness, echoing down the corridors of the palace, came a blood-curdling scream. Pharaoh's oldest son had died. At last, Pharaoh did what God said. Get out! Pharaoh shouted. Just go! And so, that very night, Moses and God's people fled out of Egypt and out of slavery. They were free at last. God's people would always remember this great rescue and call it Passover. But an even greater rescue was coming. Many years later, God was going to do it again. He was going to come down once more to rescue his people. But this time, God was going to set them free forever and ever. <coughs> Please stand.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. God, heavenly King, almighty God and Let us pray. God of might, strengthen your church through the gifts of word and sacrament that we might live in hope and promise. Grant that we may not lose heart when the journey makes us weary and the future seems uncertain or dire. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. first reading is from Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 and 13 and 14. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. Then the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, Come no closer, remove thy sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me, to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, this you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Please read responsibly Psalm 105, verses 23 through 36. 
Then Israel came to Egypt. Jacob lived as an alien in the land of Ham. And the Lord made his people very fruitful and made them stronger than their foes, whose hearts he then turned to hate his people to deal craftily with his servants. He sent his servant Moses and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them and miracles in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark. They rebelled against his words. He turned their waters to blood and caused the fish to die. Their land swarmed with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He gave them hail for rain and lightning that flashed through their land. He struck their vines and fig trees and shattered the trees of their country. He spoke, and the locusts came and young locusts without number. They devoured all the vegetation in their land and ate up the fruit of their ground. He struck down all the firstborn of their land and the first issue of all their strength. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy partners in the heavenly calling, consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Yet Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Exodus. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Indeed, by a mighty hand he will let them go. By a mighty hand he will drive them out of his land. God also spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they resided as aliens. I have also heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are holding as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has freed you from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. (laughs) 
If I asked you to name your favorite story from the Old Testament, what would you say? Noah and the Ark? Daniel in the lion's den? David and Goliath? A lot of boys like David and Goliath. They all want to go out and make slingshots after they learn that one, right? I'll bet that along with those, another one that stands out in your memory from your Sunday school days is the story of Moses. It's got all the good stuff, right? Evil king, plagues, bush burning up with a mighty voice. It's, it's really great. It's the stuff that epic dramas are made of. Here we have a boy, Moses, who is saved by his brave mother from death as an infant and eventually adopted by the king's daughter and raised as a prince of Egypt. But then he grows up and he returns to his humble origins only to commit murder trying to defend an Israelite who is being beaten. He flees for his life, rescues several damsels in distress, is taken home to their father and ends up marrying one of the daughters. Sounds kind of like a fairy tale or an epic movie, right? And all of that stuff happens before the real story even gets underway. All of that happened before our, we ever started with our readings today. So Moses is one of those characters that we think of as a hero as the knight in shining armor or the cowboy with the white hat on the white horse who rides in to save the day, rescuing his people from slavery and leading them out to freedom in the promised land. But if we make Moses the hero of this story, we are missing the point entirely. Moses is no Charlton Heston or John Wayne or Indiana Jones. He's an old man who spent the last 40 years of his life in obscurity, tending to the sheep of his father-in-law out in the wilderness. He doesn't even have a home or business of his own. Moses, just like Abraham, you'll remember, is elderly by the time God really gets down to business with him. In fact, at the time that Moses encounters God in the burning bush, he is 80 years old. And rather than bravely setting out to save the day, he cowers in fear and offers multiple excuses as to why he is the wrong guy for the job. Send somebody else, he begs God. So... If Moses isn't the hero of this story, who is? The same one who is always the hero of every story, the great I am himself, God, the one and only God. The passages that we read today reveal a new facet of God to us. This is the first time that God shares his name with his chosen people. The phrase, I am who I am, and you'll notice it's in all capitals in your Bible. It's the same with the Lord. Anytime you see the Lord in the, in the Bible in the Old Testament, it's always in all caps because that is God's name. Uh, it can be translated also, I will be who I will be. So not only I am who I am, but I will be who I will be. The essence of it seems to be that God simply is. God was not created. God never didn't exist. Everything else in the world was made, right? But only God simply is. Independent, sovereign, beyond the control of any other power, eternal, no beginning, no end. Stan Mast writes this about it. He says, Indeed, until the epiphany of our Lord Jesus Christ, this story of the burning bush is the most awesome theophany, and that's a churchy word, a pastor word, Theophany, it means an appearance of God. 
like epiphany, you know, appearance. Theophany means a God appearance. So this story, he's saying, is the most awesome theophany in the history of redemption. I say that because it's the beginning of the main act of redemption in the Old Testament, namely God's liberation of his people from the house of bondage. Yes, God had appeared and spoken to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, thus inaugurating the covenant between God and Israel. But all of Israel's history will be focused on this history-changing action of God in the Exodus. And it's at the moment that God reveals his name to us, that everything changes. You know, those of you who came to the class this morning when we looked at that timeline and we saw how, everything, how Jesus' birth is the hinge point of history, right? History, everything before Jesus, B.C. Everything after Jesus, A.D. Jesus' birth is the hinge. Well, for the Old Testament, this event is the hinge. Everything goes around and comes from and centers on God coming down and saying, okay, I'm going to free my people, and this is how I'm going to do it. He's been active, kind of behind the scenes, for the past 400 years here. So it's been 400 years since Joseph. Last week we learned about Joseph. 400 years have passed, almost twice the length of time that our country has even existed. The Israelites were in Egypt, and they, over those years they became slaves. And so for 400 years God has been around, but kind of quiet, right? He hasn't, been spoke, hasn't spoken, and he hasn't been seen since his last conversation with Jacob way back. So we can sympathize with the misery and the rage of these Israelites as they're suffering terribly as slaves, and their firstborn children are being thrown into the river and killed, and they're beaten, and they're oppressed, and they're like, where is our God? Why doesn't God come down here and help us? Why is God so silent? We've all asked those questions at one time or another. We've all thought, God could fix this. God could go like that and fix this terrible problem in my life or in the world. Why doesn't he do that? And that's what the Israelites were asking. But here at last, God does show up. And he shows up with words and deeds that will shake Egypt to its foundations and shape Israel for the rest of its future. The epic encounter begins with a curious sight, a bush that is burning and burning but never being consumed. Can you picture a bush with green leaves being on fire? That's... A crazy thing. Of course Moses was struck by that, and he had to come and see. So it got his attention. And then, when the Lord saw that Moses had come over to look, God calls his name from within the bush. Now picture that. There you are, out with your sheep, minding your business, and you hear this booming voice out of this miraculously burning bush. God now has something to say something that will change Moses' life and the history of the world. So contrary to what Israel might have thought or assumed about God, given their terrible situation in slavery, God has indeed seen the misery of my people, he says. And God has heard their cry, and God says, I am concerned about their suffering. God hasn't ever forgotten them or abandoned them or left them. God then reveals his plan to rescue his suffering children. He says, I have come down. God has come down from his throne above the heavens to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land that I will give them, he says. That is the amazing and wonderful thing about God. He doesn't just float around somewhere up there in the heavens. He doesn't expect us to be good enough or powerful enough to climb up to reach him. Instead, he comes down to us 
here on earth where we are. He came down to make a covenant with Abraham. He came down to wrestle with Jacob one-on-one. -on -one. He came down in the burning bush. And he came down for you and for me. God came down. Aren't those beautiful words? Words that anticipate the ultimate coming down of God. Because this whole story is just a foreshadowing of the bigger story, of the final rescue. Because Jesus was the best theophany, the ultimate appearance of God. Anything we want to know about God, we can learn by looking at Jesus. Whoever sees me has seen the Father, Jesus tells Philip. And what do we see when we look at Jesus? We see a God who reached out to all in love and forgiveness, who said, I will never leave you or forsake you. We see the one who made himself nothing, who became a servant, who humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. We see our beloved Savior, Rescuer, and Redeemer, who defeated the powers of sin and death forever to free us, to free us from our slavery to sin and fear and shame. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is God of Grace and God of Glory.
please stand as you are able and join me in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we give our offerings to the work of the Lord. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious Heavenly Father, we spend so much of our prayer time requesting things from you, which you have asked us to do, but also you have asked us to thank and praise you. 
In this season of thanksgiving, we lift up our praises for all your bountiful gifts to us, for all the ways that you work in our lives, for all the ways that you care for us and love us. We take these moments to silently thank you for all your blessings. Lord, in your mercy. Jesus, you prayed on the last evening of your life that we would be one as you and the Father are one. We pray, therefore, for the whole Christian church on earth, that we would be united in our love for you and in our love for our neighbors. We pray that our divisions would not be as strong as the love we have for one another. And we pray that we would be a witness to you, a light shining on the hill for all the world to see. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are torn apart by war and violence, families that have been wrenched apart, those who have lost people they love, lost homes and livelihoods and all that they have. We pray that you, the Prince of Peace, would be present, that you would put an end to war, that you would thwart those who seek power for their own gain and that evil would be stopped wherever it is found. And that among those who suffer, you would be present with your peace and your hope. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court, for all of our branches of government. We pray that justice would prevail. We pray that you would be present with all those who are elected or appointed to serve, that you would guide them and direct them in doing what is your will. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we lift up our veterans. We thank you for their willingness to give and to serve that we would be kept safe and free. We especially lift up those who have been wounded in body or soul or, or who suffer from PTSD or other effects of their time in service, Lord. We pray that you surround them with your care and that you show us how to reach out to them in love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are ill or undergoing treatments, who are recovering from surgery, those who are homebound. We especially lift up Amy Sue, Lonnie, London, Renee, Barb, Darlene, Raylene, Cheryl, Vicki, Tana, Glenda, Cadence, Lois, Daniel, Vicki, Gary, Tyson, Scott, and all others whom we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, gracious Heavenly Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy. Through the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn, We Praise You, O God. Go in peace, serve the Lord.